Scripture says in the book of Habakkuk, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. The word burden is quite unique in the fact that it is that heaviness that God places on someone's heart that cannot be released until it is shared. A burden needs to be shared. Uh, a while back, uh, Lance Swearingen um, was, he came to me and shared about a burden God had been putting, putting on his heart. And uh, we talked about it really for quite some time. And it was one of those things, sometimes he would be awakened at night with these things and his mind was always thinking about it. And uh, he finally put those words to paper and uh, shared them as a letter from hell. He let me read it. And when I read it, um, I said, this is the burden God's put on his heart. And it's going to be pretty amazing. So I, I, we, I helped him with it a little bit just to, to, to make it where all of his thoughts could kind of flow. And he's going to come this morning and he's going to read to you what God laid on his heart. The burden that God shared with him, he's going to share with you this morning. Morning, church. Morning. Doing all right this morning? Good. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time right here because uh, I don't like talking about myself. But I have a really heavy burden for those who are lost. Equally, I have a heavy burden for those who say they are saved, but the style of life that they live is contrary to the Word of God. So this letter that I'm going to be reading, I want you to, you'll hear my name a lot, and I want you to place your name there as if a friend, relative, loved one was, if they could write you a letter in hell. So no one knows exactly what it's going to be like when one reaches eternity without God. We have a lot of biblical references that tell us about Jesus, what he said about the horrors of a real place called hell. The Bible tells us about death of the unbeliever in the Old and New Testament alike. I'm going to read to you a fictitious letter. Could this be what might it be like for a close friend or loved one who could die, could write you a letter in this ghastly place called hell? Obviously, letters like this don't exist and they cannot occur. But I hope you just listen to this letter and listen closely and keep your heart and mind upon the Lord. Dear Lance, we were on our way to the park this evening. The kids were laughing and cutting up in the back seat. My wife is always on her phone when she's in the car. While I was running through the radio station, I came across a news report of some several storms that had previously moved through several states, killing many people. I flipped the radio station and found another report of the millions of people who had lost their lives due to a virus sweeping the globe. Lance, I was, it was hard for me to hear. As I turned the station again, it seemed to be one thing after another. Natural disasters, sickness, bloodshed. I didn't want to hear it anymore, and I turned off the radio. And instantly, at that very moment, a driver crossed the center line and struck our SUV. It happened so fast, it seemed like everything was in slow motion, and yet I didn't even want to. I didn't even have time to think. I could hear my kids and my wife screaming, and all I remember was being pinned under the car, gasping for breath. I felt so weak, so sleepy, and nervous all at the same time. Lance, it was not even my fault. The sirens got quieter and quieter until they finally just faded from my ears. My soul lifted out of my body. I remember looking down on the wreck, my babies are crying for me and reaching out for comfort, but I could only watch from above. Lance, at six o'clock, I died, and I stepped into eternity. I'm only 30 years old. I just, and just like that, it's all over. I had plans, I had children, I had a career. Now I'm dead. While I was looking down on the wreck, I was snatched from behind and was dragged, dragged away. I fought in a bag tr and tried to escape, but it was useless. I was so confused. I just kept saying, I don't belong here. I'm a good person. But then I heard a voice out of the dark, which kept telling me, this is where good people go who are not saved. I would say I went to church on and off my entire life. I knew Bible stories. I even helped out with youth activities. This is all wrong, Lance. 
I heard about hell my whole life, but I never dreamed it was so real. Death to me was like a dream, but this is more vivid than anything I ever felt. The reality of this place is more real than anything on earth. Lance, I do not have my body of flesh and blood anymore, but I still have all my senses, which I had while I was on earth. I remember the Bible story Jesus told in Luke 16 of the rich man who went to hell and was so thirsty. I always wondered how a spirit could be so thirsty, even though I do not have a body of flesh. I feel so thirsty. My throat hurts. My tongue is swollen. My eyes burn. I now know how the rich man who would have done anything for a drop of water off Lazarus' finger. I could smell the brimstone and the sulfur burning, just like Revelation 21, 8 says about this place. It is full of brimstone. It burns like a liquid fire, giving off a rotten egg stench that's so horrible. The fumes of the sulfur is like poison which chokes me. Lance, I only hear the roaring and cracking and popping and popping up at flames mingled with the screams of pain and agony of people. It goes on and on, and there is no place for these desperate souls. This place is so large, it reminds me of a cave that descends down and down deeper and deeper to a hole which has no end. Sometimes there is small rooms, and sometimes it looks like an endless valley of fire. It goes down and down into different chambers, just like it says in Proverbs 7:27. Darkness is so thick, we feel it here. And yet we are engulfed by the flames of this fire. I see millions and billions of souls in cages that look like prison cells. Lance, this is, Lance they are tormenting us. Oh, the screaming. I don't understand, Lance. The physical pain, we feel it, is much more than anything I could stand. I can't explain it, but my emotions are going crazy. I'm so afraid. Fear is just paralyzing. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a spirit, but I feel every emotion I felt while I was on earth. These feelings are stronger than anything I ever felt in my body, magnified hundreds of times over. I remember everything which happened while I was on earth, just like the rich man in Luke. I remember everything about my life I lived. I remember every opportunity where Christ convicted my heart, every vile sin which I committed, every feeling of conviction of the Holy Spirit gave me, every tug on my heart. This happened to me time and time again. I remember all the happy times on earth as well. I also know I will never leave this place. The memories are going to play over and over in my thoughts forever. I'm so alone. Depression, loneliness, hate. They flood my emotions like a river, which is drowning me in misery. Lance, a hooded creature, keeps dragging me through hell. I see hideous creatures everywhere. There is a spirit of all shapes, sizes, ranks, and powers. They are cold and heartless full, and full of hate for, for us down here. They enjoyed the torment, and, more, and the more we cry and beg, the more they mock and torment us. They consistently tell me in detail that they are, what they are going to do, when I, do to me when I'm done with this letter. God is so full of grace and mercy, but these fallen angels, they have no attributes of God. They, are, they have no mercy. They have no grace. The hate... They hate God and take it out on us with all their fury. This hooded creature, he brags about how he deceived and twisted God's word while we were on earth. They quoted the Bible like scholars. They know it from cover to cover. I told this spirit I wasn't supposed to be here. I was saved. He laughed and mocked me and he quoted Matthew 15, 8. And he told me that I only had a mouth profession but I never had a heart change. He boasted his job on earth was to deceive people into believing a lie and they were, that they were saved when they were not. He screamed in pain at us as well. He told me, he led me to think I was saved while, I, while the plain truth of God's word told me just the opposite. I believed the lie 
because I wanted to hold on to my sins. I lived out hypocrisy, a double life wearing only a name tag of Christianity. Yet God's word said in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I chose to believe the lie instead of God's word. I could only hang my head down in shame, Lance, because I knew it was true. Lance, do you know how many people in churches all across the world who are headed to hell? I was told to tell you, to tell you of the people I saw here before I end this letter. We entered the first chamber. And I saw a professor from college. He always told people that hell was a scare tactic created by a religious crowd to scare people into submission. He said hell was an invention of weak-minded religious people to keep church in line. These demons brutally tormented him, and they screamed at him, and they kept asking him, do you believe in hell now? Do you believe in hell now? In the next room we entered, I saw a rich man. This man went to a very large church and gave millions of dollars. He seemed so dedicated to the church, and yet he, he is screaming. He keeps asking the demons, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I am? They mock him and said, yes, your highness. He tried to bribe them, and they quoted Acts 8.20, Thy money perish with thee. He screamed and said he would give it all away for just one more chance. I also saw a man who died around 18. His, he's begging for his mom and his dad like a three-year-old baby. He was so defiant and stubborn and rebellious on earth. He caused much grief for everyone in his life. They taunt him over and over. He cries out. We also passed one chamber and it was filled with multitudes of people. Lance, it was filled with those who had hurt children. They turned a blind eye to their responsibilities. So some had a huge milestone chained around their neck and they were thrown into the ocean of fire like Matthew 18 says they would be. I saw teachers who knew children were being beaten and abused at home, yet they said nothing. Lance, I saw parents who sold their little ones for unspeakable acts. There are mothers here who, who allow horrible things to happen to their children at the hands of their boyfriends and others. I see parents who would not help their children or, or correct them because they only want to be their friends instead. I see so many parents who lived their lives as slaves of alcohol and, and abused their, their precious children. They are so tormented, but they keep saying they are so, so sorry, and they will never touch a drink again. I see mothers who neglected their babies while they chased after man, after man, after man, and their drugs. These demons keep telling them all the terrible things they did to the children while they were having fun neglecting them. One demon reminded them that they will never see their children again. There are dads who never took their kids to church and treated God as if he were an option. He is screaming for mercy, saying, I'll get my priorities in line. I'll take my family to church. Please give me one more chance. I saw women who desperately wanted to go to church, but they wait, waited on their husbands. But, but they simply didn't want to go. These men followed their lusts, and, and they, let, they let the world, worldly things in their lives control every, everything that they did. We move on to one cavern and hell to another. Lance, the people are so angry. I see so many people angry at their own families. They scream with, why did you not tell me? The children screaming at their parents, why did you not tell me? Why did you not tell me every chance you had? Why did you spare the feelings of my, at the expense of my own soul? The demons are torment, tormenting them and telling them of the beauty of heaven and how parents are enjoying heaven fine without them. We walked into a room where I, I saw multitudes of people crying for Jesus. This is a room of those who attended church faithfully. They knew the scriptures. They worked in the church. They knew Jesus. They knew who he was, but they never changed their heart. These are the ones Jesus called lukewarm. They were hypocrites, pretenders. 
They were screaming promises to God. I'll promise I'll do this. I'll promise I'll do that. We entered a valley, and the valley was vast lands. Is this full? It was full of detestable and horrible things that I can't even bear to mention in this letter. I am sick to even see the things in this area of this valley. These are the ones who were consumed by their sexual sins, fornication, idolatry, lust, pornography, and homosexuality. I see men with a yoke on their neck, and they were being dragged into the fire. They screamed for mercy, and I immediately knew that they were the ox being led to slaughter in Proverbs 7:27. They lusted willfully. There were ministers who practiced homosexu homosexuality in the church. They tried to plead their case and say, God's word only condemned the violent and sexual sins, but true love between two men and two women were not what it meant. The demons laughed at them and they told them that they were, that that was a lie to, to spread to cause means to believe it. They led churches to embrace it. They led society to lessen the stigma of it one generation after another. The demons quoted Romans 129 to them. We entered a cavern. I saw all those full of hurt and unforgiveness and bitterness. They were hurt by churches, spouses, friends through the years and allowed the hurt to fester and become hardened in their hearts. This was a large group of people. I then saw who murdered the rapists and molesters. They allowed the hate of, their, of these people to fester in their hearts until unforgiveness doomed their own souls. The demons quoted Luke 6, 37. He told him to be forgiving, you must first forgive. There, is, there are addicts who are begging for their drugs and alcohol. They are in a constant state of withdrawal, which never seems to get better. They are constantly being taunted. They were tempted on earth to kill themselves. They, they now have every lie ever told to them, repeated about their addiction. They were reminded, they were told, oh, oh. they were reminded they were told they were not an addict. They just needed one more time for their drinks and their drugs. And then it could be their last time. We entered the last chamber and it's full of preachers, pastors, priests, rabbis and Pharisees, and all types, of all types of church leaders. I saw a pastor I knew from, the, from a church down the road who was so self-righteous, he was always condemning and judging. He kept so many people from God by putting heavy man-made burdens on them. This man dressed as a good person and acted holy. But the demons kept telling him, he was full of dead man's bones, as Matthew 23 says. They put him up in an upper seat in the room, continually mocking him, acting like he was God. They tell him he was nothing but a modern day Pharisee who the truth condemns children of hell. Lance, there is a preacher from a huge church you see on TV. His hands are literally covered in blood. He keeps trying to preach even in hell. The demons are mocking him and shouting hallelujah and amen. The demons laugh at him hysterically. One of the demons turned to me and said, now he wants to preach, preach the truth. Now he was, while he was on earth, he avoided the sermons on truth and preached a social feel good gospel. He avoided sermons on hell and he never wanted to offend anybody. He was comforting people in their sins and telling them they can have their life full of prosperity. He was consumed by his politics. Lance, they're telling me my time to share this letter is over now. They're putting chains around me. They're laughing at me and, tell, and reminding me that I will never see my babies again. This vile creature stopped and looked at me and said, everyone is here because they chose to neglect the great gift of salvation. They chose their sins instead of repentance. They listened to the lies which were told to them and never listened to the truth. 
They will be here alone forever, tormented. And all they needed to do was believe in the Lord, repent of their sins, and ask God to save them. God would have forgiven every single one of them. Those who, who would repent. Lance, this demon said he, he would do everything in his power to keep my children from the gospel. He said he would bring me here for hell's torment. And he then began to tell me of all the things he has planned for those I love. Why did my parents not warn me? Why would my preacher tiptoe around this subject? Why would they ignore this subject? <laughs> Lance, tell my family. Tell all my family of this place. I remember the rich man pleading for someone to go and warn his brothers. Why did I wait till I was in hell to decide to tell my family of this place? Why did I wait till I was in hell to decide to, get, to be a role model for my children? to take them to church, to show them the love of Jesus. Why did I not encourage them more to take them to church? Why did I not encourage them more on Jesus? Why was I so interested in other things of this world? How did I get my priorities so messed up this is not a joke, Lance. Warn everybody. Tell them the truth of this place. Tell everyone about Jesus' love and how to escape this place. Tell my families to repent. Beg them. If anyone tries to tell them this place is real, do not believe them. If I could only go back, I would change everything. If I could only go back, I would scream the truth about this on the rooftops. Why, Lance? I ask you this last question. <clears throat> Why did you not tell me? You said you were a Christian. Why did you not warn me? Some time has passed. Lance, something is happening. I'm not sure what is going on, but the demons, they have stopped tormenting us. They're running around hell like they're scared. Oh, Lance, I think I may know what's happening. Oh, Lance, I'm so scared. The fear is crippling me. We are being lifted out of hell and we are going to the great white throne judgment to stand before the Lord. This is my opportunity to plead my case. I can't go back. I just can't, Lance. Could I possibly give an account on why I need to be in his kingdom? You would not believe the multitude of people here. There are too many to count. The wrath of God is paralyzing. We cannot look upon his glory. I do not know where we are, but this place is, it reminds me of a courtroom. Everyone here is being judged on their sins and is being brought before the judge of the universe. Well, Lance, this is my time. I have to stand before the Lord. Lance, I gave my account to the just judge. The Lord, he told me, as it states in Matthew 7, 22 through 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did, not, did I not prophesy in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. This is the end of the age. This is it. I will be thrown into the lake of fire. I will by no means remember anything that is good. No more love. No more peace or hope. I will no longer remember anything of the good things which the Lord wanted me to have. 
I will be tormented by my missed opportunities throughout eternity. And I bow my knee before him. And I told him he was the one true God who is holy. Lance, why did you not warn me? As I stand with the multitude of people about to be thrown into the fire which burns, I see now it all makes sense. Now I, wipe, now I try to wipe my tears from my eyes. Now I have to ask those of you who say you are saved, what have you done with that great gift of salvation? Do you put it up on a shelf? Or maybe you put it out of your mind not even wanting to mention the name of Jesus, except when the storms of life come crashing down, you cry out to, you, to him, wanting something from him. What have you done with that great gift of salvation? Let me put it to you in this perspective. I'm sure everyone here has somebody they care deeply for, whether it be son, a daughter, grandchild, maybe neighbor, coworker, I'm sure we all have somebody we care deeply for. <laughs> Let's say you're out in your backyard, you're having a fellowship, having, getting together, having food, you're fellowshipping, having a good time. You live near, near a railroad track and one of them little ones starts running by the railroad, running to the railroad track because they see that nice shiny rail, the sun's glistening on it. You know how babies, they, they love shiny things for some reason. They're making a beeline to that track and they're playing on it. And before you know it, you realize they're no longer there. You see them, there is a train coming. How are you going to get their attention? Would you whisper to them and say, back up? Would you not even make a commotion, maybe a kind of motion and wave your hands? Or would you scream, no! How are you going to get their attention? We have something that has been given to us so freely, but yet there was a cost, the cost of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. You see, that great and free gift that was given so freely, in 2 Peter 3, 9, in the second half of the verse, it tells us, he is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. He didn't say few, he didn't say some, he said all. He desires a relationship with you but he's not going to force you to have a relationship with him. He knocks on your door. You have to let him in if you want that relationship. Now, we've been going through a study in the Beatitudes that Brian's been preaching over the few weeks. And in part two of the series, he had mentioned eternal life, everlasting life. You know, joy with no, without no end, peace without no end, perfection without no end. It's an amazing thing that we can all have. But the same is true about hell. Everlasting torment without end. Pain, anxiety, depression, without no end. And one thing that chokes me up, just to mention it, something I know I won't have to endure, praise God, but separation from God 
without no end. To me, that is terrifying. So, I have to ask you two questions. And these two questions is this. Do you believe there is a real God, a real heaven, and a real hell? And is there any sin worth going to hell for? And you need to find yourself in this altar right now. If not praying for yourself, praying for your friends, praying for your family, praying for those who are lost. But here's the truth. Jesus spoke, spoke more about hell than he did heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than every other person in the Bible together. And if we believe in the gospel, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That meant that there was another way. There was another truth, and there was death. He came to fulfill the gospel. The cross would have been unbelievably cruel if it had not been for the reality of being separated from God forever in a place that Jesus called hell, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think in the day that we live, and I heard Lance's words, and those are words that need to be heard, and you could tell how one scripture after the next was laid and the burden was placed upon his heart because the word of God is truth to lead us and guide us and to help us. But all I really want to share with you is one simple thing that Jesus said about hell. I think it's so vitally important. I don't think we need to miss it at all. In Mark chapter 9, verse 42, the Bible says this, this is Jesus speaking. But whoever causes one of these little ones, sometimes it's rendered children, but he's not talking about the four and the five and the seven years old. He's talking about the ones that have not matured yet. The ones who have heard but have not fully grasped it yet. The other word is perfect or mature, complete. So he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, to stumble. Last week I preached the extra beatitude. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And I said that word offended was kid the diesel. And that's the same word that is here, stumble. Exact same word. And it means a stumbling block. One, something that was placed in the path to make one trip up or fall. And it means something that was placed in one's life to make them distrust the truth or to make them disbelieve something. Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to be tripped up, to be led to disbelieve or not believe the truth, to not trust his words, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The great big stones of great weight, a, a human person could not push them. The only one we know of in Scripture was Samson. But a, a beast of burden would take it and, and turn that on the grist mill to grind the grain together. It would be better that that great big rock or stone would be thrown, uh, placed around someone's neck and thrown into the water than making one of the little ones to stumble. He goes on to say the same things three times. In verse 30, 43, he says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to enter into hell. Into hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He goes on to say it three times. In verse 43, he says, 
if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Verse 47, if your, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. But after each one, he said the same phrase, the same phrase. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having everything that this world has to offer but to go to hell. There are two things that are talked about in Scripture. One is hell, and one is called the lake of fire. The best way that I can describe it is this. Don't be distracted, folks. Please let the Lord, this is his words. Hell is like going to jail where you will be held until you go into judgment when you stand trial. But then at the great white throne judgment, everyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as the personal Savior and Lord is taken and thrown into a lake of fire. He uses an illustration here where the worm does not die. Outside of Jerusalem, there was a little place on the southwest side of Jerusalem. It was a valley called Hinnon, the word Gehenna. It was a place that back in the days of King Asa where they would take and in the worship of a pagan thing, they would take their children and kill their children and throw them into the, the fire. How terrible to worship the king Mo, or the god Molech. How awful. And Satan must have laughed at that. But they changed it and they made it a dump. People would take the refuge there. And if a person died and he didn't have family or a, a grave or something like that, they would just take their body and throw it in and he would be burned up. And because there was daily trash, the fire was never quenched, and the smoke of the flame would be constant. And because the bodies of animals and people were there, yes, the worms were there. And if they would ever stop, then the worms would go away. But they would always be adding more to. And Jesus used this illustration, speaking of eternally, the lake of fire. Jesus, who spoke, spoke of the love of God, Jesus who fulfilled it on the cross of Calvary to make a way. Jesus who would become our sins if we would allow him. Because he's a God of love, he doesn't want anyone to go. God is not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. But if you turn down the gospel, if you turn down the opportunity to accept forgiveness in a relationship with God... What bothers me so much is there are so many people who pray a prayer that they don't even know what it means, and they say their life doesn't change, and they say that everything's good, and they have false hope. It bothers me because so many times I hear people say, I, I, I've always felt uneasy about this. I've always felt like God was telling me that I needed to be saved, and I'm looking back on an old experience. Folks, they, they want to say that that was a devil. The devil's never going to tempt you to get saved. Only the Holy Spirit of God will do that. The only thing that matters is the peace that goes beyond accepting and receiving the gift of God. For everyone that's watching online, and yes, for everyone in this building, Jesus tried to convey more than anyone else the reality of hell. I know in this world today, it has become unfashionable. Those are the ones that Jesus said it would be better if a millstone were placed around his neck and they were thrown into the sea. They tell you, oh, it's just when you die, that's just the end of it. Annihilation. You're just gone. You breathe your last, you breathe no more. That's a lie from the pits of hell. They say in universalism that, yes, you may. Even the Roman Catholic Church, you will go to a place, a holding pattern, where you'll have a chance to repent. Not one scripture, not one scripture says that you have another chance after you die. Your fate is sealed. And now this new modernism of, well, 
for those that hear the gospel, they, they will, if they don't believe, they'll go to hell. But those who never hear, they'll just automatically go to heaven. It's just one lie after another after another. One of the most popular ones in the churches today is they believe, oh, God knows who's going to be saved from the foundation of the world. So if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved. And if you're going to be lost, you're going to be lost. It's your choice. It's your choice. No one else can make the choice for you. You have to hear the voice in your heart. No one else can do it for you. New Holland, you know the gospel. You know the gospel. But none of us in this room truly know the agony of hell. But we know this. God doesn't want us there. And we wouldn't wish that dread on any person. And the world needs to know.